So this week we will be reading chapters 10 and 11 from Blood on the River. As always, if you haven't already, pull up the quiz from your infinite campus. And as we read, I will stop at each question so that you have time to answer them. So we'll go ahead and get started. Chapter 10. The people in all places kindly entreating us, dancing or feasting with us, strawberries, mulberries, bread, fish, and other their country provisions, whereof we had plenty, for which Captain Newport kindly requited their least favors with bells, pins, needles, beads, or glasses, which so contented them that his liberality made them follow us from place to place, and ever kindly to respect us. Captain John Smith, a true relation of such occurrences and accidents of note as hath appeared in Virginia. Captain Newport goes off exploring with eight or nine gentlemen and a dozen sailors, they leave in the shallop the small boat they put together here in Virginia, so they will be able to navigate the narrow riverways. He takes Captain Smith along to be an inter interpreter with the Indians. They go in search of gold and silver and to find that, to find that new passage to the Orient everyone is talking about. They don't take many provisions with them. They say the last time they went exploring, each time they approached a village, the natives invited them in and fed them like kings. So question number one, what did the natives feed the gentlemen like? What did the natives feed the gentlemen like? So with that, we'll keep going. In Jamestown, we continue to work. We build a chapel for Reverend Hunt. We hang an old sail between four trees as an awning to protect us from sun and rain and nail a bar between two trees for the pulpit. The walls are rails of wood that let, su that let the sunlight right in and logs on the ground are our pews. Reverend Hunt calls us together for prayer, to thank the Almighty for all that we have, and to ask for protection. It still has not rained, and our wheat fields and gardens are wilting. We have found no fresh water springs nearby, and so we are still dependent on the river for water. Richard, James, and I spend the afternoon bringing buckets of water from the river to dump on the tiny new shoots. When I take a drink, I find it is still salty, and I wonder if we are killing the young plants rather than saving them. So question two, why does Samuel think they are killing the plants? So why does Samuel think they are killing the plants? What does he think they're killing them with? Keep going. Richard and James keep to themselves, talking to each other, but not to me. I think about Reverend Hunt, what Reverend Hunt said about being kinder to James. But if they treat me as if I am not there, how can I be nicer? Maybe not yelling at them, not calling them names, not hitting them. Maybe that is enough. So, question three is a short answer. Do you think that Samuel's plans to be nicer to James and Richard will be enough to change their minds about him? Why or why not? So your answer could sound something like, I do not think that Samuel's plans to be nicer to James and Richard will be enough to change their minds about him because, or I do think because, so make sure you restate the question, give your answer, and then give your explanation. So three parts. Restate, give your answer, and give the explanation, okay? And we'll keep going. After supper, there is evening prayer in the new chapel. Reverend Hunt says we will have common prayer every morning and evening from now on, and two sermons on Sundays. By dusk, I am so tired I can hardly wait to get to bed. It is cloudy. There will be no moon tonight. I go off into the woods to relieve myself. I hear a rustling nearby and squint in the half-light, but I see nothing. Was it a deer? Maybe just a squirrel or a rabbit. As I walk back to camp, I hear the sound again and whip around. This time I see a form. Something dark slipped behind a tree. The hair on the back of my neck bristles. But maybe it is just one of the other men relieving himself as well. Who's there, I call. No answer. I take a few steps toward the tree where the dark, from the dark form slipped away. Winnipeg, I called out. Silence. It must have been a deer, I think. I go back to our camp. So, question number four. Why does Samuel yell out Wingapoo in the forest? Why does Samuel yell out Wingapoo in the forest? So, remember what who, what people use the word Wingapoo to announce themselves. So, why do you think Samuel would be using it? So, go ahead and answer that question and we can go. I creep into our tent and flop onto our bed. It is the same bed that the three of us shared on the ship, and by now the straw is rotting. Henry and Abram's bed is crammed into our small tent as well, 
but the two of them are still out playing cards with the sailors. Richard is already asleep, dead to the world, snoring softly. James stirs, and I know he is still awake. I think about saying goodnight to him in an effort to be more kind. But I am so tired I just close my eyes and almost instantly asleep. It drags me up out of a dream, a shriek like a demon's cry. At first I think I am still dreaming, but there is another piercing cry, then another, and soon the forest is ringing with the noise, as if all the demons in hell have entered our camp. I bolt upright. I can see barely more than shadows. An arrow pierces our tent and lodges in the ground next to me. James is sitting up. Richard lies there sprawled. Has he already been shot? Get under the mattress, both of you, I shout. Are they still afraid enough to obey me? I'm going to the ships, James cries. He crawls toward the tent flap. Now I yell. I lunge after him, grab his ankle, grab him back. Get under the mattress. Now I order him. Richard groans. He is either waking up or dying. James wriggles out of my grasp, head towards the tent opening. I grab him, harder this time. He turns and sinks his teeth into the flesh of my arm. Yow! I snatch my hand back. In that split second, James is out of the tent. Another arrow twangs past my ear. Richard is sitting up now, rubbing his eyes. I grasp the edge of the mattress, dump Richard onto the ground, and pull the mattress on top of both of us. I can hear my own breathing and the blood pumping in my ears. Will the mattress protect us? I remember the discussion. An arrow will fly right through a mattress, you idiot. No, it won't. Yes, it will. Won't. Will. The argument rages in my own head. I expect any moment to feel the sharp pain of an arrow through my chest. All around us I hear footsteps, shouting that god-awful shrieking, the twang of arrows being shot, men crying out in pain. Finally I hear musket fire. Kill them, I think, but the twanging of arrows continues. I feel the impact as an arrow hits our mattress. I feel no pain. Richard, are you hit? I shout. Silence. Then after a moment, I don't think so. I want to yell at him that this is a stupid answer. He is either in pain or he is not. But if, I've, if I am ever going to be nicer to James and Richard, now is the time. Do you hurt anywhere, I ask. He moves as if testing his body. No, he says. Suddenly there is a great boom. Someone has boarded one of the ships and is shooting the cannons. I hear a crackling and a crash, the cannonball hitting a tree. Then I hear the pounding of bare feet in retreat. Soon all is quiet. If someone made it to the ship safely, James could be there as well, I think. I feel sweaty and clammy under the mattress. I think we can come out now, I say to Richard. We both heave the mattress off of us. Outside, men come with torches, calling out, Who is wounded? Who is shot? We crawl out of the tent and find Abram lying there, an arrow in his side. I was just coming to bed, he says in a weak voice. I guess I didn't quite make it. Here I call out, A man is wounded here. Two men come and lift Abram. He groans. We'll get you to the doctor, they say. James, he went to the ships, I tell Richard. We make our way down the, toward the river bank where our ships are moored. Along the way, we step over arrows lying everywhere on the ground. Captain Gosling wa comes walking up from the river. I realize he must be the one who fired the cannon. He is carrying something draped over his outstretched arms. In the gloom of the cloudy night, I can't see what it is. I hear Captain I hear running footsteps behind us. Captain the man calls out. There are 17 wounded, no one dead. The running man holds a torch. As he comes closer, the torchlight glints off of Captain Gosnold's armor and makes clear what he has in his arms. It is James, his thin body lying limp. No, says Captain Gosnold gravely. This one is dead. So, chapter five, er, question five. Okay. What kind of conflict is James having in the tent? So, is he's going to be having two different kinds of conflicts. So, which two is he having? To so remember, James. What happens to James is question number six. So, what happens to James by the end of the book? And then, question number seven. Do you think Samuel could have prevented what happened to James? Why or why not? So, again, restate the question and then give your answer why. So it could be, I don't think Samuel could have prevented what happened to James because. So make sure you have that restating of the question as well as your explanation. And that finishes chapter 10.